Well, hello, everybody watching at home. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are Dark Horse Comics, and um, most especially, we are here to uh, present some Eisner Award winners. Um, the Eisner Awards, of course, were presented as part of Comic-Con at Home this year uh, in lieu of the in-person ceremony that usually happens at San Diego Comic-Con. Um, so thank you so much to Comic-Con International for uh, putting that together. And it was uh, probably the quickest ceremony I think any of us have ever seen for the Eisners. Um, but we wanted to give a chance to uh, get all these folks together at least as much as we can be during uh, COVID times and uh, congratulate all of our winners and also um, give them a chance to say uh, what their own uh, thoughts on winning and um, thank yous and any other uh, congratulations we might want to offer one another. Um, so first I would like to just introduce everybody who's here with us today. Um, let's start with uh, Karen Berger, the editor of Berger Books. Hi, Karen. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much going? for joining us. Couldn't be anywhere else right now. So. <laughs> the place to be. True. <laughs> um, so this was a big Eisner for Eisner Awards year four Burger Books. Um, so major congratulations. It to puts you. us officially on the map, right? So um, <laughs> yeah, nothing like yeah, nothing like the Eisner Awards to make you to make you legit. So now it's 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 thrilling, um, you know that. Uh, these creator, these wonderful creators and, and their books won. And, you know, there's so many great comics out there. You know, it's such a big field. And, you know, to be um, noticed uh, within that field and to be, you know, given the, you know, the crown jewel is, it's pretty amazing. So, yeah, so, so thank you to everyone field. in the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so the books in question that have won, um, we'll start with Invisible Kingdom. I'd like to introduce uh, Willow Wilson, first of all, writer, and Christian Ward, artist. Hello to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Uh, so Invisible Kingdom specifically won Best New Series, which is kind of a big deal, uh, <laughs> I think. Um, and uh, Christian also won Best Painter and Digital Artist for his work, not only on Invisible <laughs> Kingdom, but also Machine Gun Wizards. <laughs> so congratulations to both of you. Um, would you like to say anything real quick about Invisible Kingdom just to start off? Willow? Sure, yeah, no, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Invisible Kingdom kind of started out because I had all of this leftover research about monastic orders that I'd done for my prose novel, The Bird King. Uh, I was sort of studying 15th century monastic life and uh, monks and nuns and all of this stuff in, in Southern Europe. And I used about 10% of it. And the rest of it had kind of been spinning in my head into this sci-fi epic about space nuns. And uh, so, you know, when I pitched it to Karen, I think I was kind of like space nun uprising. <laughs> it was like the shortest pitch that, that I'd ever done in my life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it really has been so much fun. Working with, with Christian is such a joy because, uh, you know, of the, the, the light and the color and the sense of scope that he brings to all of this world building that we've had to do. So it's, it's just been such a fun romp of a book to work on. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited that, that uh, so many of our colleagues have felt the same way. And um, yeah, I, it, it's, it's ironic and weird that it's happening at this time, and, uh, but uh, it's, it's good to know that the community is still there. And I'm, I'm really, really honored that uh, 
that everybody was enthusiastic about this book. So it's really exciting for me. And Christian, uh, big, big Eisner Awards for you, two awards. Well, yeah, it's crazy. Didn't expect it. I, I was really, really shocked having <laughs> that. Yeah, it was, it was like, I'm still, I still kind of don't believe it. Like, I don't think I'll believe it until I'm holding them. But yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy. But I just like, thanks to, you know, Karen and Willow for kind of thinking of me in the first place. Because um, I remember I had a Skype conversation with, with, with Willow because, crazily enough I almost almost didn't do the book um I remember because, I had to woo you a little bit yeah <laughs> and it was it was a process <laughs> yeah it was because it was the whole thing was just like oh, I you know I, all my books all of my books so far have been like sci-fi cosmic and I remember long before kind of Karen got in touch with me I was like okay whatever I do next it's not going to be sci-fi cosmic whatever I do next. <laughs> long, long before, and I was like okay it'll be something different I didn't want to be typecast I don't want to be the cosmic guy <laughs> and then and then Karen I was like, oh my god like, like one of the legends of the industry was like, oh, I was like oh and I was like, what is it what is it and was like, oh what it's a cosmic book I was like ah <laughs> yeah and then we had this like it, we had like a half an hour like to an hour kind of like Skype conversation because I was really nervous oh, do I want to do the same am I going to be retreading the same ground and and you just completely won me over with, with the idea and within half an hour it was like <laughs> I'd gone from kind of like, I don't, I, I, I must avoid sci-fi and cosmic to, oh, it would look like this and then I could do that. And then, it, and then, and this is how it would be different from Odyssey and, and from Black Bolt. And this is how I would approach it differently. And, and these are going to be my, my, the artists that are going to kind of inspire the look. And um, yeah. So thank you for that, taking the time to convince me because if I hadn't done this, I would have been an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would have been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations again to both of you and to Karen as well. Um, I know, uh, obviously, we're all doing this from home. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us and taking a little time out of your daily lives. Um, and we just wanted to, to give everyone a chance to see one another for one thing and, uh, you know, enjoy these honors uh, together. Um, so without further ado, I would like to also introduce our other guests today. We have Tana Ford and Nettie Okorafor, who are the team behind LaGuardia. Hello and congratulations to you. LaGuardia won a Best Graphic Album Reprint, which really just means graphic novel, but you know, not a brand new OGN. It's the collection of the series. Yeah, it used to be comic books that then became a regular book. Which is also a major award. So congratulations to you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that beautiful, beautiful spot gloss on that. Oh, the spot beautiful. gloss. Did you see that? Look at that. <laughs> Look at it. It's so good. I <laughs> mean. Well, thank you to you both for joining us as well today. Um, did you, anything you would like to uh, say, shout out to your team working on this book? You want to start? Yeah, you want to start? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this was this was an incredible, just an incredible project. There's so much behind, like the genesis of of the idea, but like just the experience of bringing this this um, this dynamic work together. I want to specifically thank Karen for, yes. <laughs> you know, for one being a fantastic editor. So so oh, that said, you. also. In particular, you know, and, I, and I've said this before, you know, it was your call to put that protest on the cover. Yes. You know, there's like <laughs> on the cover. And I remember at the time, you know, Tana and I were both like, you know, we weren't sure. We weren't like, we were like, okay, that's, that's, that's yeah. really bold. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, maybe we just want to do like this one. It, it has everything we need on it. Or maybe we'll do like the cover to three, which is, you know, like, objectively beautiful and it's not at all you know uh it's not this inciting riot that's coming or uh like a protest march coming across the brooklyn bridge and you you were like this is it this is that's the cover that's what we need yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was so smart it was the perfect choice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it you know it hey 
as we know, protests are nothing new, you know? And, and you know, I mean, as Nettie was writing this, um, you know, I mean, the Trump's travel ban, you know, happened yes. while you just were about to write the second script, you know? So, yeah. I mean, it was that, you know, the timing of, unfortunate timing of stuff like that, um, yeah. you know, in our world, um, you know, Nettie was, you know, brilliantly, um, uh, wove that stuff in you know in, into the story oh. and um and I remember Nettie you were saying well you know when you were saying about you know maybe we shouldn't use that cover you know because you know I, I, I wanted to tackle race and discrimination but I'm coming sort of at it sideways and that's not sort of kind of a the, the main story, a, a future you know and and, and the baby and um and but you know, my feeling is, you know, theme is, you know, theme rules, man, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. your instincts and ultimately, are yeah, amazing. that's, that's tra transcends it. So, so yes, sorry, I didn't mean to break, break the rule. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. It was so smart. <laughs> it was the right call. It was, it was call. exactly the right call. Yeah. 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 Uh, the colors on it are fantastic. We had uh, James, James Devlin did the covers. He's so good. Uh, and he made just the characters as vibrant and alive. And I mean, we have this one character who is sort of an iridescent uh, and he got these shimmer effects. And yeah. then our letterer yeah. was able to do all these different voices. Like I know we had talked early on about using the format of graphic novelature to uh, to really make the characters feel dynamic, individual, give them their own voice. But how do you do that in a two-dimensional medium where there's no audio track, right? And uh, Sal did a, did a phenomenal job. The whole, it, it's just, the whole team was incredible. Ugh. Yeah, Karen, you work with uh, Sal quite a bit on your books, right? Yeah, well, Sal also um, lettered Invisible Kingdom as well, too. Oh, so. he's so good. Yeah, yeah he's great. And, he's so yeah, good. I know him back from the DC, from DC days, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I know he, yeah, he's... Uh, yep. At this stage in my life, I'm kind of like, I want to work with people who know what they're doing. <laughs> so I don't have to like, you know, hold their hand too much. Um, and uh, and Sal is, uh, yeah, he's, he's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he just did such a good Sal job. Cipriano. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. watching out there. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kudos to you, bud. And James, I mean... Jimmy did such good work. He uh, he really he took my pencils and inks and he made them come to life. He just he breathed atmosphere, light. We have a lot of um, like holograms and um, you know techy stuff, and he was able to do that stuff brilliantly, uh, and it really Which, makes yeah. it feel alive. Yeah, I mean you know as as the saying goes, color can make or break a book. Mm -hmm. A book, oh. you know, and and in this case it. It didn't do either of those. It was all part of a part of a great book, but 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 the importance of a good colorist is yeah. um, you know is is you know you can't understate it. Um, but when I remember when I first started working at DC, um, one of the ways to um, to that's when when there was hand coloring done on on guides, and one of the ways to tell if a story made any sense, if the color made sense, was to turn the page upside down and see if you could follow it from backwards. That's what I was taught. <laughs> That's what I was taught, and it actually makes sense. So anyway, sorry, oh, going down memory lane here. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I like that the art form has evolved over time, right? Like we we were talking a little bit about graphic novels before we came onto the air. And like in our lifetimes, it has evolved. And one of the ways that it has evolved is, you know, things about color theory and how colorists work and how line work happened, lettering now that happens. You have all these different layers, all these different, you know, people, uh, cooks making a big stew together and uh, I think for books like this, where it's a collaborative, of, like a, a, a team effort, it, that really having a core team that you can work with so well, I think shines through in the final product. Absolutely. Uh, before we dive into, um, I want to definitely explore these books more with you. And um, I want to also shout out, though, uh, we had some other Eisner Award winners on that note, including best coloring for Dave Stewart, um, who colors everything. Just about. It's really good. 
<laughs> so amazing. major uh, congratulations to Dave. Um, for Dark Horse, of course, he works on all of the Hellboy and the BPRD titles. He also uh, did some coloring for Black Hammer Justice League, which is a fun crossover we did with DC, um, and just a myriad of other books for other publishers, too. So major congrats to Dave Stewart. Um, we also had a win for Snow Glass Apples, which is an adaptation of a Neil Gaiman short story done by Colleen Duran, and she knocked it out of the park. Um, major congratulations to oh. Colleen and to Neil. Um, best adaptation from another medium, uh, just fantastic. So check out Snow Glass Apples too, if you get a chance. Um, our yes. awesome tech producer, Gary, is showing you uh, these books on our stream here as we're chatting. You can find more info about all of these at darkhorse.com, of course, available widely now wherever books are sold, bookstores, comic shops. Um, and I just want to remind folks too, it, despite the difficulties of COVID and um, shops being mostly closed or at least um, social distancing right now. Um, please check with your local comic shops to see what options they are offering right now. A lot of them are doing online ordering. Um, some are doing pickup. We have some local shops here in the Portland area that are doing delivery even, mm -hmm. which is very impressive. Um, so all of these books, all these Eisner Award winners um, will be widely available at your local shops as well as at uh, bigger retailers too. Um, would anybody, would any of our guests today like to shout out any of your local shops or um, any other folks that you know are working hard to bring comics and books to the people during uh, COVID and social distancing? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I can shout out um, Afriware Books and they're at Afriware, the way it sounds, A-F-R-I-W-A-R-E books.com. And they have, um, they actually have, I think all of my, all of my works and then they have um they have signed and unsigned and then they have some of the the comics the comic book versions of laguardia the comic book editions of laguardia they, they still have a lot of those available so yeah yeah afterwarebooks.com perfect nice yeah i'd like to shout out uh, gosh uh, london uh, it's not my local store but it used to be my store when i lived in london i love, gosh. And oh, I love no. Great shot. But they've actually got um, a, a book plate edition of Invisible King, the one signed by, by me. Um, so you can you can get that. And then they deliver uh, international. Oh, uh, actually, I do have a bookstore. Uh, it's no longer my local bookstore. But when I lived in Boston, if you're a Boston local, uh, Kamikaze in Davis Square, uh, they're the same people that put on Ladies Con every year. I was there in September and they have signed copies by me in their store right now. Uh, and they do curbside pickup and some delivery if you live in the city. Uh, but they're a great store. They have great people that work there. It's Kamikaze in Davis Square in Boston. You guys should check them out uh, and follow them on all the things. They're wonderful. I wish they were still my local store, but they're not. <laughs> I've got two stores that I'd like to shout out. The first is Phoenix Comics and Games on Capitol Hill here in Seattle. Um, they're a great shop, not just for picking up books, but they also run game nights. They have all kinds of clubs. Um, I think they're doing uh, curbside pickup now for anybody who wants to swing by who's local. The other bookstore that I really love that's also a fam famous Seattle icon is Elliott Bay. They have uh, all every single kind of book you could possibly imagine. They have a robust graphic novel section, a science section. I've launched uh, all three. Yes, that's right. Yeah, of my prose books out of that store. <laughs> so they're nice. like my test audience um, they have signed books not just by me but by many of the uh, large community of authors that we have in Seattle so and they ship as well nice Perfect. Oh, that's wonderful <laughs> I'd also like to mention Forbidden Planet um, oh, in Greenwich so Village and uh, also the ones in the UK too um, but um, as as a great shop um, I wish St. Mark's was still around. Um, uh, I think Mitch um, closed down the shop, I think about a year or two years ago, but that was a great shop, St. Mark's. Um, and Jim Hanley's um, also in the city and um, Midtown Comics with a couple of um, shops as well. 
Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for these excellent recommendations. You can find all of these online, of course. Um, we'll drop some links in the chat. And I like to remind folks there's always comicshoplocator.com, which is a compilation of shops all over the world, actually, not just North America. Um, so you can check that out and find shops that are near you. There's also indiebound.org, which will help you find uh, local bookstores near you that are offering another variety of uh, online orders and pickup and all sorts of things. So um, we'll drop those links in the chat and uh, be sure to check these out. And we hope that uh, you are able to find all these books that we are talking about today. Um, I also just want to real quick let people know you are welcome to ask questions in the chat. Drop those questions in the chat and our moderators will be watching those and we'll work those into our little discussion today with um, the guests we have here with us. and. Um, we also will be doing a giveaway as we normally do. However, this time it's going to be a little different. Uh, you can enter to win a copy each of LaGuardia and Invisible Kingdom Volume 1. Uh, we will be giving these away to those who will we'll share a social media link after uh, we conclude today. So look out for that. It'll be Dark Horse Comics on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, enter to win with preference going to teachers and librarians. Who would like to use these books in your classrooms perhaps or you know uh spread the word and so uh follow dark horse comics on social media and we'll announce um that giveaway opening as soon as this panel is done today um so without further ado let's get back to uh discussing these award-winning books these soon to have the eisner um sticker or logo if you will <laughs> I made an Eisner, I made a cutout for when we watched the Eisner uh, live, you know, we because you could watch the live stream and there wasn't going to be like a little trophy that we could get and I am pretty tactile so I wanted to hold a thing so I just like found a picture online and made a little foam core one. <laughs> I love it. Like, tell, tell us more about your live watch party. Look at this. Uh, I have a wonderful friend. Oh my God, who's probably watching the stream right now. Hi, Ashley. Um, and she's been at comic book conventions with me. She's wonderful. She is a fan from Chicago and uh, she's also pretty techy and uh, put together a live stream for us to watch together. And uh, so I was able to invite my mom and dad. Nettie was there. Uh, my dog, my grumpy dog was there. Uh, a whole bunch of friends got together and actually had it set up so that we could like stream the announcements. And then, you know, we were like, you know, we were able to see each other and, and it was a whole amazing thing. And, uh, and it was a really, it was a way to find community at a time when we can't hang out with each other. And it was really wonderful and very touching. I'm glad you were able to do at least some uh, live celebration. I know this this is a little bit delayed, but- uh, I love it. To get everybody together. I mean, even under normal circumstances, uh, most of us don't normally get to see each other face to face very often, except for at conventions, so. Did the rest of you guys miss, are you surprised with how much you miss con conventions? Uh, question for the group. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say, yeah. I mean, like, like, for, like, I'm very much an introvert, so I like to just, I come out, yay, hi, everyone, and then I'm gone. And I, I definitely miss, and I can't believe I'm saying this, because I am the last person <laughs> to say this, but I do. I miss seeing everybody. I miss sitting in the back and listening to everybody talk in person. And yeah, I miss that. And um, there are a lot of things that I normally wouldn't miss that I'm missing now. And yeah, that definitely. And like with this, gosh, it would have been so cool to to be there for this because I mean, it's a big deal. And it just would have been nice. And I actually do miss, I miss Comic-Con this year. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I can't believe I'm, but yeah, I miss, I miss it. And um, yeah. <laughs> you guys? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah, I mean like I, this was gonna be a big convention year for me, which is unusual because I have, you know, sort of my, my comic book career sort of took off at the same time as I had two children 20 months apart. So early on, I couldn't really do very many conventions um, without like it being this, this sort of logistical nightmare of 
flying in my mom or having to like take the kids and then leave them with my husband in a hotel and he had to take anyway so now they're old enough where I can do a bit more traveling and I was really looking forward to uh you know being a guest at Emerald City which is our local Seattle convention um being at uh, San Diego I was going to be a guest at Thought Bubble which I was super excited about um because it's you know it's the show everybody raves about and this was going to be the first time that I was going to be able to go and uh and here we are (laughs) (laughs) you know and uh it, in some ways, I think oddly, it's brought us closer together because we're yeah. we're all no matter what else we're struggling with, we're all in this particular situation at the same time, and yeah. and so there's there's sort of I think a le- a level of communion in that. But on the other hand, it's um, I'm kind of getting sick of seeing my messy bookshelves in the background of like every professional <laughs> yes. thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was a surprise to me. What about, do you get to a lot of conventions? Not, not really. No, I mean, I, it was weirdly, I was, I was flying over for um, Emerald City for the first time. And it was nice. my first, it was my, um, I've only done, I've only been a guest at one of a US con. Oh. Um, so it was quite a big deal. And I was quite excited about it. And I had to, I had to go to the US embassy and get a visa and, you know, so it was, we were, I was quite excited about it. It's similar to Willow. We, I mean, I've got two children. I've got a, a three-year-old and a two-month-old. Um, so it's, uh, so I knew like it, it, doing Emerald City was before then um, Florence was born. It was, it was like my last hurrah for, for a couple of years, you know, so it was yeah, like, you oh. really, Yeah, you're upset. <laughs> yeah, I was good. I was good. But it was, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, no, I was just like, oh yeah, just to go to the hotel and have a nice sleep. <laughs> um, where everyone, everyone's in the bar drinking. I'm like, oh, I'm sleep. <laughs> see, see you in ten hours. <laughs> so yeah, that hasn't happened. <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah, I was surprised. I missed it. I was surprised. It's usually so stressful, and there's travel, and you, like logistically, it's always a mess. And usually, I'm I'm really happy when I'm there, but they're exhausting. And I was like, oh, this will be, you know, like we'll just hunker down and get some work done. It'll be fine. And I'm like, oh my god, I didn't realize how much I was relying as an introvert, how much I was relying on meeting people, you know, meeting face to face, having interactions with collaborators mm-hmm. that do the same thing you do, and how important that was, you know, in my life until it wasn't there anymore. And I was like, oh, I'm surprised by how much I miss this. Yes, exactly, exactly. I also miss hearing, I, it would be so great to just hear what people think right now. Yeah. You know, every, you know, I would love to just hear everyone's perspective on their work, on like their, the stories that they're creating, the art that they're producing, and all of that within what is going on now, I would love to hear that. Like with everybody together bouncing off of each other. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. That would be cool. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a pretty common refrain that I've seen from a lot of creators, I think especially, is that uh, suddenly we really miss seeing each other. <laughs> and I, you know, it's, it, I, this is, we do things, I'm very solitary, right? I imagine it's the same for all you guys. Like I stay at home and I work and I'm alone and I see my partner and you know, my partner works in a hospital right now. So like, we don't see anybody else. Um, And like, and it's, and it's, it is weird. It is a weird, I have been consuming a lot more media. I have a lot more time for like movies and television shows and, and things that like, I just wasn't prioritizing before, but now I'm like, oh, well, here's this new thing. I can do that. Have you guys found that to be true? (laughs) A great time to consume comics. Uh, A great time to consume comics. (laughs) Which are available digitally as well. <laughs> nice, good work. <laughs> I've run out of TV. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh. I just came to the end of TV. At a certain point, in just I check like, it oh, off. I've watched so. all the TV that there is. I feel like I have too. I feel yeah. like I've watched all the really, and there's a lot of really good stuff. But I kind of feel like, yeah, uh, I'm yep. just, waiting. I'm just waiting for something. Yeah, yeah. Though I love. Um, Michaela Cole show on HBO. I mean, oh my just, gosh, it's so good. It's like my new favorite show. 
Yeah. Oh, it. No. It's the most recent one, like right before, the, right before this meeting. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. We do uh, have a few questions coming in from chat. And uh, actually, I think this is a great point too. Um, by having to go virtual with San Diego Comic-Con this year, a lot of people were able to participate online who have mm -hmm. never been able to mm -hmm. be at San Diego Comic-Con before. So that at least is, is something. Um, <laughs> And uh, it is kind of disappointing that, uh, I mean, Emerald City is typically our first big convention of the year. And um, yes, as Christian said, uh, Christian was going to be one of our big guests. We had a lot of new convention exclusives and things that were going to debut there, which made a lot of sense, like Christian's cover art of, uh, based on Nirvana's Nevermind album for a series we have going on now by Mike Allred. Um, called X-Ray Robots. Uh, so those convention exclusives, actually, we were able to um, put those online too, so people could order those. Um, there are still some limited quantities available, but I believe I just saw today that um, we're about to uh, close that down. So nice. get on that if you're interested. Um, major shout out once again to our conventions and events team, Katie Bednark and Kat Haber for pulling all that together. Um, Cause that's not something we are normally able to do. Um, but you can find those online too, direct.darkhorse.com um, while they last. Um, unfortunately, no yellow bags. Uh, sorry about that. Dark Horse edition. Um, next year, <laughs> hopefully. Um, we also had a couple questions um, for the writers. Uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about um, the differences or challenges uh, from going from writing prose to writing for comics? Um, and maybe we can start with Nettie. Um, yeah, there. It's it's an interesting transition. I do a lot of different types of writing, so I'm always jumping from like screenplays to um, to comics to prose, and then sometimes the prose is in different lengths and I don't really know what, it, but it, it's all, it, to me, it, it feels it's, it's the differences are big, but it's like a fluid kind of thing. And one of the biggest differences for me as a writer of comics and um, novels is the economy of words that I have to um, always be aware of in comics, you know? And it, it's, for me as a novelist, that's good. You know, they, they kind of like, I, there are certain lessons that I learn in comics that I can apply to novels. So there's always this, um, there's an, always this interplay between the, the two, the two uh, forms of writing, but they're very different. Like with, with novels, um, and I'll just stick with novels as opposed to novellas and short stories, which I also do, but with novels, when I, when I sit down to write them, so half of the time I won't even know if it's a novel, I'll just write a story because I, I don't outline or anything. So it's just, I just sit down and I just start writing a story and it just goes where it wants to go. With comics, it's very different. You come in knowing how long it's going to be, you know the structure, um, and you know that you have to have an economy of words. So it's a very different type of, uh, it's a different type of, of thinking about the story, but the story itself is this like the, the way the story comes is similar, if that makes sense. So like they're different, but there there are similarities and they don't flicked in my mind. They're they're part of the same part of the same very big beast. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Everything comes down to beasts for me, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I know, and we kind of touched on that topic too. Uh, Willow and Christian joined us for a stream recently, which is now available to watch again if you want on our YouTube and Twitch, um, talking about Invisible Kingdom. Also, just for the folks who may not be as familiar with the books, um, do you mind uh, just giving us the quick synopsis of these two titles? Um, maybe we can toss it back over to the Invisible Kingdom crew to uh, fill folks in on that one first. You want to take that, Chris, or should I? <laughs> you, you take that. You take oh, that. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll nod. I'll nod. Along with you, encouraging me. So, in, yeah. <laughs> um, Invisible Kingdom uh, takes place sort of from the point of view of two different people living in uh, a solar system that has several different inhabited planets, but no faster than light travel. So it feels 
weirdly claustrophobic in a sense for a for a sci-fi series and in it grix who is a freighter pilot for a large uh corporation that delivers consumer goods that is in no way related to anything on earth um <laughs> and she and a young acolyte of a new religion named Vess independently discover a conspiracy between the renunciation which is the uh the, the sort of the most popular religion in the solar system and lux which is this big uh multi-planetary corporation and they have to go on the run together from forces from both sides who are trying to shut down their message and along the way they meet space pirates they meet sort of a splinter group uh, that is uh, in theory going to make the world a better place by reforming this religion but has something up its sleeve um so you know like there's there's politics in there there's there's uh, sort of meditations on religion um but there are also a lot of chases through various different uh environments uh, there are spaceship crashes there are all kinds of different aliens and uh so it's it's meat and potatoes you know like it's protein and starch <laughs> um in a way that i hope feels fun and exciting and it's also a love story too it is also a love story yes yes i don't want to give anything away because like there's kind of a cliffhanger <laughs> Right. That's all I'm saying. Ah! Yeah. That is like literally being resolved in a way that I'm not going to hint at in, in who I'm writing right now. <laughs> yes, there's there's a will they won't they love right. story that right. unfolds uh, with some twists and turns. The best kind. And there are two volumes out now, just so everybody knows. Uh, two volumes so far of Invisible Kingdom. How about uh, LaGuardia? Yeah. I will try to keep it short because I, I, I just go off on huge tangents. Um, <laughs> on the first, the first issue, it was described as a very, was it a very modern story of immigration? Yeah. I think that's a good, um, it's, it's, gosh, there's so much. Um, the way that I've been describing it is it's uh, African and alien immigrants living in a, an apartment building in Brooklyn, New York. There's a lot more to the story. Um, the story starts off with, it's fine, it's not a spoiler, but you know, it's the beginning. So the story starts off with our main character, Future, um, leaving Nigeria, and she's smuggling an illegal alien alien into, through LaGuardia Airport. And that's, that's the beginning. So. It's a, um, it's a story that has a lot of different themes. It's science fiction, of course, African futurism, but it's also, it deals with, um, with the themes of identity, um, immigration, prejudice, culture, diversity, humanity, alienity, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and, and like the, so, so like the way that the way that the story came about was interesting because it's like that whole that whole sequence at the beginning where she's smuggling the alien through um, TSA is it, it was from some in instances with the LaGuardia TSA that I had to deal with. So that was like the beginning. But when I started to kind of kind of uh, grow out the greater story. Um, an elevator pitch actually developed in my mind for this. And it was actually what I pitched to Karen originally. And I normally don't do elevator pitches, but this one came to me as an elevator pitch, which is crazy. Um, but that elevator pitch, which I cut and pasted directly from what I sent to Karen, was a futuristic contract with God, the Will Eisner book, uh, focused on, on African and alien immigrants. So it's, it's very, it, it became exactly Exactly what it How is. I say no. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, love, I love it. Yeah. I think both of these books <laughs> had amazing elevator pitches. On that note, <laughs> actually, just one, just a, a little, another, a little. I don't feel like I'm reminiscing on this whole panel, but I love it. Let's reminisce. Another, another aside of, of my uh, early days at DC was when I first started working at DC for Paul Levitz. 
um, I, you know, I knew very little about comics, you know, when I walked in the door, I wasn't a fan and, um, you know, just read Archie and Mad mm -hmm. Magazine when I was a kid, because I had two older brothers who had Mad Magazine, but I didn't know, really know anything about comics and just fell into the, you know, fell, fell, fell into the job through a friend of mine. Um, and I still remember Paul, on Paul's bookshelf in his office, he had a contract with God. And he had Gen of Hiroshima, or as I said back then, Gen of Hiroshima, before I knew <laughs> my Brooklyn accent. Um, and and I, was, I said to Paul, what are these two books? These look nothing like all the superhero stuff. And he yeah. said, oh, they're really good. You should read them. And wow, they, you know, reading those two as a really, mm -hmm. as a real newbie in the field made, made, made such an impression on me. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. And there's yeah. there's something a little bit dark, uh, maybe even not a little bit dark about Contract with God. Like it it wow. tells the story of Jewish and Italian immigrants living in tenement housing in New York City when it was like in really sort of dire circumstances. And when I first read it, I was like, I didn't know that comic books could be that. Um, and I think that at the time it came out, people didn't know. This is why Will Eisner was so revolutionary, right? Like he, he mashed up. Graphic novel, there was never. Yes. A and book, a novel about in comics. Yes, that you had, you know, you had periodicals, you had newspapers, you had, you know, the daily funnies and, but there was never the elevation to literature, right? Like think of all of the stories that we're able to tell now and the various ways that we're able to tell them to blend words and pictures. And one of the very first things to ever do that was contract with God. And um, it was real life too. It was, and it was real it didn't life. Fall as much as, hey, I love genre. I mean, my life is genre, I feel. <laughs> um, but, but this was a story by real people. And yeah. Well, and that also was you know, huge. I mean, especially at the time. But yeah, yeah. we yeah. Uh, we take yeah. it for granted now. But it, it there weren't always stories like this. There weren't always real life stories. It had to start somewhere, and that's where it started. And for me, one of the like, I don't know, one of the weird feelings I've had about winning the Eisner with a book that is standing directly on the shoulders of Will Eisner's own work. There was something very fulfilling for me personally about that. Yeah. Um, ooh, I'm getting yeah, a little, I'm getting some chills. I feel chills. the same way. I feel the same way. I really, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had the honor to, to work with Will um, <sighs> on a few things towards the end of his career. Oh and it was just like such an amazing, it was like, uh, you know, I just, between him and Joe Kubert, I kind of felt yeah. like I, you know, was blessed to be able to work with these, you know, with, with such creative pioneers and such nice people too. Oh, you know, it's so nice when they people. turn out to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that like the, the way that I discovered a contract with God is a story in itself because I was in the middle of my PhD program, having gone through, you know, my BA, two master's degrees, and then working on the PhD with professors telling me that you know, writing science fiction and fantasy was bad and wrong and not proper literature, right? So I'm just in this, and I didn't listen to any of them. I didn't. Good. And I thought, <laughs> thank I God. Not once did I even think, oh, maybe I'll, maybe they're right. Not once. But like, I used to go to the library at the University of Illinois in, in Chicago. That was where I did my PhD. And I would just go in there and just look at the books. Just yeah. look at the, like, not even looking for anything, just look at the books. And the books were shelved with no cover. So I was going through and somehow I must have found the graphic novel section because I saw this book and I saw the title, A Contract with God. And that title was, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so that was why I picked it up because I saw the title. I didn't see anything else. Oh. It didn't, like, I didn't know that those were graphic novels. So I picked it up and when I opened it, I saw pictures. You know, I saw, I'm like, yeah. what, is, what is this? And I'm like in the library where, where this is supposed to be the house of academia. And mm -hmm. like, it blew my mind. So I, I checked it out and I read the thing. And the moment I started reading, I'm like, I did not know. Like that was where I discovered. Cause you know, I came to, I came to comics very in a backward way, you know? And, and so I like had to discover certain things. I wasn't in a community that was like, you know, you should read um, yeah. barefoot Gen, 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 whichever one, like yeah, you should read yeah, these things, yeah. you should read Mouse, you should read, I, you know, I wasn't being told that. So I had to discover them in this weird way. So that was yeah. the way I discovered 
contract with God, it blew my mind. I didn't know stories could be told like that. And these were stories of immigrants. Both of my parents are immigrants. And a lot of those, those tales like reflected, I, I, I got it, I got it. And so like that has remained my favorite graphic novel because there were things that he was doing visually that were, that just, you know, incredible. It's just mm -hmm. utterly incredible. So, so yeah, it, it's like, I'm not even, when I talk about LaGuardia being inspired by that book, it's like, I'm not even exaggerating at all. Like that was- It, it sounds like it, it called to you. It, I don't know, it, it must have, because I wouldn't have known. And after I discovered that, I went on to read everything in that shelf because they had a whole <laughs> bunch of different graphic novels there. And it opened up the world of, yep. like, it opened up the world of comics for me, like in a way that was weird because it was through academia which you don't you don't normally expect but that's how i love that's that yeah. Oh, yeah that's such a cool that. story i mean will, you know what one of the great things about will will is that he never made any apologies for for the medium you know he was mm -hmm. you know at, you know like as you were saying that it's just you know comic it's just a, another form of telling stories and he never said you know it, it's it's words and pictures or it's it's something that kids mostly read i mean or it has to be a certain way he made no right. apologies for it and he and he um you know spoke of just you know what a wonderful way to tell stories yeah, you know, this yeah. yeah. He's, he's really quite a remarkable remarkable yeah. person and he never sold out never sold out and, and at a time when you had to you had to there was no other way really and he you know, with the spirit, he yep. kept his rights and, and um, uh -huh. when he did the comic strip at, uh, I forget which syndicate, he actually owned his rights, which uh -huh. no one else was able to pull off, you know, um, never sold out. So anyway, okay. Sorry, I'm digressing again. I think this is an appropriate <laughs> forum to gush about Will Eisner, yeah, exactly. though. I think yeah, it, it is. It's about someone to gush about Will Eisner, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. I have to ask, had, did any of you see or did you um, get your hands on a copy of the curator's collection we did of that last year? Uh, it's a two volume set and one volume is the pencils and thumbnails that oh, Eisner yeah. did. And then the second volume is the finished ink pages. Um, and if you don't have that, uh, we'll chat after this and all. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's let's yeah, chat after this. <laughs> yeah. yes. It was actually up, ironically, for an Eisner last year. Um, <laughs> how does I mean? Did he win? <laughs> uh, it was book design, I believe, oh. the category. So uh, there was some stiff competition, oh. but oh man, um, I mean. Yeah. It's, oh, it's a beautiful collection. It's just, it's amazing to see his work in progress in that first volume, I think. Um, yeah, it's, yeah Gary, is, Gary is showing us some of the interior pages. Thank you. Some of those nice. iconic panels. Nice. Yeah, it would be fascinating as an artist to see how he worked, right? Like we always, not always, but we often see just the final product um, in books. And one of the fascinating things for me, and Chris, maybe this was the same way for you. Growing up, I loved to see artist sketches, the development process, character design, and that stuff is readily available. You can watch artists and creators in real time making that. You can read it. Even in LaGuardia, we have uh, back matter in the back of the book. Um, and I try to put that kind of thing in all of the books that we do, sketches and how pages come yeah, together yeah. and you know character that. design yeah. and all that stuff. Um, but when I was growing up, that was very rare and I treasured it. And so I wonder, you know, my, and these not for here, but like how you guys found or have access to all of the pencils, all of the process stuff, all of the inks, like, that stuff is really, I don't know, fascinating to me, valuable. I love that. I love that stuff. Chris, did you have, did you find that, you know, you gravitated toward artistic process? What were your influences? I don't know. I mean, well, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I've never read any Will Eisner. Never, mm -hmm. never, never picked a Will Eisner book up. I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware, obviously. Right. I've, I, but I've never, <laughs> never read any of it. And, hearing about contracts of god i'm like oh there's a big hole i need to fill um, yes do, but, um, you do. <laughs> yeah 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 there's um, time there's time bud there's time there's a lot of time now. i mean I, 
yeah. I think what got me excited, I mean, I remember when I was at school, all I wanted to do was draw comics when I was like 14, 15. Yeah. Comics, comics, comics. And my art teacher was just like, no, <laughs> nobody earns a living drawing comics. You've got to do this, you've got to do yeah. that. You don't you know, draw comics. And I, and I think kind of the thing that got me most excited about comics when I was um, a teenager was um, um, discovering Dave McKean. Oh, uh, Dave's and what amazing. he was, um, yeah, and what he was doing with Neil Gaiman, and then what oh, he did with yeah. Grant Morrison, and just sort of seeing that. Oh, hang on, comics art don't have to be pen and ink, and that yeah. was the thing that blew my mind. It was just like yeah. they don't have to look like this. Yep, they can look like this. You know, Ugh. anything, and, and that was the that was the the, the explosion. Yeah, and I've did never looked back since. Now, did you study art in school? Did you go to school? Do you have like classic art training? Yeah. You no. Did? Well, I I um I mean I, I just did normal kind of like you know, what you would call high school education, and then I went and did a degree at um at illustration. So it was basically it. it was trying to find it was trying to find what I wanted to do is well, what's the commercial where am I going to yep. find a job? Um, yep. but I I used to be a a, a fine art painter. For you can tell years. with yes. I mean the way the, your stuff there's just such a quality of line control and. Not accuracy, but mess. intentionality. Oh, it's so good. It <laughs> is organized it, mess, my friend. It is gorgeous. Yeah, it is breathtaking stuff that oh, you can do. It's just, it just, it just it, it, I used to be an art teacher for 10 years. Um, <gasps> and it's just, all it is, is just giving into the mistakes. Yeah. All it is. And it's just like, we're owning them. Well, yeah, it's yeah. meant to look like that. Oh. Meant to look like that, you know, just 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 going with it. I shouldn't yeah. be saying this in front of Karen. No, I work really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything I do, it's all intentional. It's all it's intentional. Good. I don't like, care. Like, you know, I plan it all out. <laughs> I know exactly what it's going to look like when I start. <laughs> hey, I mean, you won Best Painter Digital Artist, so I oh. think. That's so, yeah. Uh, we have, oh, we're getting some interesting questions in the chat here too. Um, uh, we have one for Nettie. So this, this one gets, um, I'm going to read it directly so I don't mess anything up. <clears throat> We've had various iterations and interpretations of classic myth and Western sci-fi tropes in modern comics. What myths from the African diaspora do you think are ripe for presentation or reinterpretation in modern comics? Um, <laughs> Just an easy one. Yeah, really, really easy one there. Um, uh, I will say all of them. <laughs> There's so many. And, and I, I will also say that like um, Africa is a really big, big <laughs> continent. And each of the countries has so much and then it's not just that like um you go in, in we'll, we'll we'll talk about nigeria because that's what i know most in nigeria you just go down the street and there are different myths and folklores for that small group of people so like it's 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 wide open it's wide open um there are there are so 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 many different uh myths legends uh folklore um cosmologies that people actually still believe in now um all of that and it's it's there's a plethora of it there's a plethora of it and um so sticking to one um <laughs> boy Nettie, you know how to get yourself in trouble so i'll just sticking to mm -hmm. one um <laughs> group of gods is lazy <laughs> you know there are many different types of there are many many um different uh folklore all of that stuff it, it's all you know and and i think that I, I personally feel that um that that uh creatives could kind of branch out and and look at what's out there a little more because I, I feel like there's a um, a focus in specific ones. And I think there, there are so many that have not been, that, that have never been in a story before. There's so many that, that you know, there's some digging up. So like, yeah, the, the, there, there, there's a lot. That. There's a lot. Um, to, to bring it back as far as, as far as what I'm interested in personally, 
Nettie knows what Nettie knows, and you'll know when it's published. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot out there. There's a lot out there, and I think that um, I think that that creatives could uh, bear to kind of look in different directions and, and do a little bit more. A lot, a lot to explore that probably needs yeah. to. Be. Yeah. Uh, can you actually, I know that LaGuardia is set essentially in your Binti universe. Can you talk a little bit about how it falls into that chronology? Yeah. Um, so, so it's LaGuardia is set in the universe of um, the Binti trilogy and also my, my novel Lagoon. So it's like, you know, sto to me, stories are stories. Like, and that's why I, I work in so many different kinds of forms, but stories are stories. They come in different kinds of forms. Where, whatever required, whatever the, the story requires is how I'll write it. Like LaGuardia was always a graphic novel, like always comics, always. It never came to me as a, a novel first and I decided to try it as this. It was never that. It was always the, it, it was always what it is. Um, but, but yeah, so La, Lagoon is a novel, um, Lagoon is a novel that's set in, I think it's the year 2000, either 2009 or 2010, I can't remember, but like it's set basically in present day and it is the story of the aliens coming. So Lagoon to like a really easy way to describe Lagoon is Nigerians or um, aliens coming to night, aliens invading the country of Nigeria. That's what that's, and all the chaos and adventures that ensue. So, so that's Lagoon, so that's when they come. LaGuardia is about 10 or 20 years after Lagoon has happened when the aliens are now um, citizens have become, you know, incor in incorporated themselves into human civilization. And then Binti is far, far future. So you've got that world, but now we're in the far future where they've incorporated themselves even more, become the norm, and you have a lot of, a lot more interstellar travel with human beings as well. So that's really, that's how, that's how the timeline goes. It's also good. If you haven't read these, read them. Enjoy them. Uh, they are so good. And if I may um, advocate for the audiobooks, while I was drawing pages from LaGuardia, I was I knew it took place. It was sort of like the beginning of the Binti universe. And so I'm listening to the audio performance of Binti while I'm drawing LaGuardia. And it was meta and amazing. Also, it's a wonderful it's the audio presentation is just wonderful anyway. So you don't have to be drawing, but you could. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to throw this one out to everyone also, because I want to, I have another thing on that note. Um, for all of you in these books, do you have any particular favorite panels or covers from the series that you would like to highlight? Gary is kind of scrolling through right now, showing us some visuals from LaGuardia. I'm going to, um, I'll, I'll start by pointing out the, so the cover art that ended up on the trade paperback through yes. Cretions. Um, I really, really, really enjoy the little green aliens. Um, the sea sheep. Yeah, can you tell us what those are based on? <laughs> the sea sheep, they're a real thing that exists. So they're it's an artistic sweet. interpretation, but they're really sea sheep. Betty? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're sea sheep. And like, they are, um, what is it new to branches and yes. they they uh have th they're green because they have chloro chloroplasts in them and so they can perform photosynthesis so they really don't have to eat and they're cute they're so adorable like, it looks like they have little faces cute. google yeah. sea mm -hmm. sheep yeah. they're so they're so stinking cute <laughs> oh my goodness i love them so much we had so much fun making aliens i knew when i wanted to design this world that i needed it like part of the premise of this world is the integration of literal aliens into human culture so i wanted the aliens to feel it, reachable attainable familiar but sort of like horrifying in the way that like a six foot tall spider wearing i don't know a t-shirt in laguardia <laughs> would be terrifying and like scrolling through its phone like if that's an alien i'm freaked out but also intrigued and so i ended up using a lot of natural things a lot of animals a lot of plants we have a a small guy that's uh an alien who's basically just a teddy bear sized tardigrade one of the like little bio guys that you can't destroy. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we I call him Todd, but uh, I think his real name is Surveillance. And uh, but I love him. And you know, like they just sit around and drink coffee. Here he is, and he's one of uh, Let Me Live's best friends. But so you know, you have people just having coffee, hanging out. Um, but you've got aliens walking around. So I wanted it to feel real enough. I wanted it to feel familiar enough. So I looked at the natural world and I f we found sea sheeps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure they got a shout out. <laughs> but also of course, uh, Christian's amazing art throughout all of Invisible Kingdom. Um, I don't even know if I can really pick like a favorite or a standout cover, but uh, I do love that first cover, which ended up, of course, on the yeah. back. Yeah, the first cover was felt really oh, special, I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Do you want to get? Oh, uh, no. yeah. No, I, the the, the first because I remember we did the first cover like while way ahead of time because we were announcing at San Diego, weren't we? So it was, um, and it was really funny because if, if you look at the design of, of Vess on the front, she's like she's quite elaborate with like she's got all these straps and there's this little thing and like so i designed that all and then i started drawing that in the book i said like, oh forget that no. <laughs> <Maybe> <laughs> yeah yeah that. that's a special outfit that'll come back at the end maybe <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah that's no one will notice should i be drawing attention to it no probably not sure, sure. <laughs> um but did, I, it's funny because i i love all the big um the big moments like and, and willow's just such a great writer and she's so generous as a writer and she always gives you these um splash pages like even just like, like I, I love that one like just, really cool. um oh, so but i think good. one of my favorite thing is just the um the moments do you know the little character moments and just being able to like and almost the best panels are the ones where it's like someone says something and then there's a reaction and nobody says anything and it's just trying to get the what are they feeling? And just trying to kind of nail that expression and that the, the personal relationships. That, that's that been my favorite part of the whole book. Yeah. Not the big vistas and the science fiction, it's the, the, the human bits for the aliens. <laughs> the aliens. <laughs> yeah. I actually really love the, the very first scene in the first trade paperback where we're cutting back and forth mm. between the two perspectives. So we've got it's, it's the inciting incidents for both of the main characters, Gr Grix and Vess. And so we've got this, we've got the sun dog, their, their spaceship crash landing in this very dramatic way and like a spray of space dust. And then that cuts back and forth with Vess who is not yet a nun. She's sort of in her initiation and she's making her way to this floating monastery blindfolded through the city. Do. And going back and forth from this, you know, the drama of the crashing spaceship to mm -hmm. Vess, you know, in this very crowded urban environment. And there's kind of a, I wouldn't call it a voiceover exactly, but we're, we're hearing sort of bits of text from these, these sacred texts of the, of the renunciation. And uh, I'm like, wow, the, the word cinematic gets thrown around a lot in comics, but yeah, the does. way that christian sets it up and we cut back and forth between those two things i was like this is legit cinematic like <laughs> this is this is not an exaggerated use of that word so that's that's my favorite i love that beautiful i love that similar to uh coming up with those different aliens um did you get to have some fun with protest signs Oh, yes. Uh, and we actually had like an email chain going for a while where we sent back and forth like our favorite protest signs. Uh, and there was maybe not no way to know that it would be this prescient, right? Like things are definitely coming to a head now. Uh, but protests were happening when we were making the book as well. And uh, there are some really funny ones. I'm really glad that we have things like equality and justice on the cover, no hate, no fear, fight ignorance, not immigrants. All that stuff is right here on the cover. Um, you know, immig immigrants built the country, all of these things. And so uh, it is a real point of pride for me. Uh, but we definitely had some some things going on, some uh, so can you make sure this makes it in there? And I was like, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> I think that, uh, do we have Octavia New in that? Like, you might have had that. We that did. <laughs> uh, yes, Octavia warned us. 
Yeah, I'll tell you uh, more. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that was a great one. That was a great yep. idea. Yeah, yep. yeah. And then there was one about Southern hospitality that I really liked, and it was very quippy. And I had found it in you know like scrolling through um, like Google images of protest signs. And I was also at the Women's March, um, and so I had a lot of like the signs that I made and that my friends made and all of this stuff. And so making this book at this moment in history was. For, point of personal pride, like very cathartic for me to be using my art in this particular way. Um, and so, you know, that was really nice, but oh, I wonder if I'm going to be able to find it, oh, but it was wonderful. Octavia warned us so bad. Even introverts are here, ban the ban. Uh, yeah, this is all right around the first travel ban. And, uh, yeah. And I had to make signs. Octavia warned us out on the streets right now, and it would make sense. Yes. Yeah. It's you, so you really tiny could. though. I mean, you know, it's this sign right back here. But, <laughs> you know. Yeah, he's flipping through some now too. I, I've yep. seen a sign similar to that introverts one um, yep. out on the streets actually. Oh, let's see. I time traveled for this was one I liked. So bad even introverts <laughs> are here. Yep. Yep. I think oh, man. a Southerner who still believes in hospitality with an arrow pointing at them. Uh, that was one of my favorites. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. anyway, that was, that was fun. Yeah. Yep. So. Well, I don't want to keep everybody too long, but um, if you're all good with it, we can wrap up with maybe a couple more questions. And, uh, you know, as always, if there is anything you would like to say um, about winning the Eisner for your respective books, um, Please, this is, we are celebrating the Eisner wins of both LaGuardia and Invisible Kingdom and also Christian Ward just for being an amazing digital painter. So ah. <laughs> we've forgotten uh, somebody. We, we've forgotten somebody in our thank yous. Richard Bruning, the saint of spot yes. gloss and French oh. flaps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the one who makes the collected editions These look as French good as flaps. Look at that. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's a French yeah. flap if you didn't yeah. know. <laughs> Richard is our art director and graphic designer. Yeah. Um, he laid everything out. My partner in crime. Yes. Personally oh. and professionally. So, yes. Yeah. He does French flaps is how you know you've made it in life on a trade paperback. <laughs> like, that's that's the extra mile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, puts, he spends a lot of time. Yeah. He, lo he loves working on these books. He loves working with all you guys. Yeah. It, it shows. Yeah. Yeah. All these, all the burger books have not only these lovely deluxe treatment on the collections, but also thicker paper stock, mm -hmm. um, generally more pages, bigger single issues. Yep. Uh, so you should check out the single issues too. Um, those shops that, that folks mentioned at the beginning of the stream, for example, mm -hmm. you might still be able to get some. Mm -hmm. um, well, like I said, we are starting to kind of run out of our allotted time here, but thank you so much everybody who's been in chat and participating and asking questions. Um, we've had a lot of questions for the writers so far. If anybody's got any additional questions for the artists or for Karen too, um, please feel free to drop those in the chat. We've got time for maybe one or two more. Um, thank you again, everybody for joining us in this kind of virtual celebration when we don't have an in-person hey. San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, Nettie also joined us for a panel um, that ran during Comic-Con at home, uh, which is now on our YouTube. Um, and that one is Dark Horse All-Stars. So thanks, <laughs> thanks Nettie, for joining us for that. Um, it was Nettie, Gerard Way, and Matt Kind. So an interesting mm. collection of comics, writers, and artists. Um, and like I said, all of those are available on YouTube. This stream will also be available to watch afterwards here on Twitch and also at Dark Horse's YouTube. And we'll be sure to send those links around. And one other final reminder that the giveaway, if you would like to win a copy of each LaGuardia and Invisible Kingdom Volume 1, uh, you can do so. We'll post a new giveaway contest um, tweet essentially on, on our Twitter and then also post on Facebook and Instagram. And that will give you all the details as to how to win. It'll be pretty simple, just kind of a share this post. And uh, we'd like to especially reach um, librarians and educators who might uh, be able to use these books in your classrooms. Um, so, all right, Karen, here's here's one final question for you. All right. Okay. Uh, who is the writer-artist combo you want for an upcoming burger book series, Ooh. perhaps? In What's your dream combo? 
who what is it oh god <laughs> uh, i think that's kind of like loaded i mean we it, it really is loaded here. it is so loaded um i'm not even sure how to answer that one <laughs> i mean you mean a a a uh sort of a double threat person a writer slash artist is that Ooh, the yeah um I don't know. I mean, I, it's a tough one. I think I'm, I'm going to have to think about it while I am you know, talking <laughs> right now while I'm thinking. Um, it's a tough one. Um, I, you know, there are so many talented people, you know, out there. And um, uh, I love Amel uh, Ferris's work. Um, I love, um, uh, Dave McKean as well, you know, mm -hmm. as, as, as a writer and an artist and, and, um, I don't know, you know, Sean Murphy, I'd love, I worked with him on Punk Rock Jesus. Sean is an awesome artist, but he's a really good writer too. I'd love to work with him again as a writer artist. So those are kind of three names off the tip of my head, hat, whatever, mask. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the the message of today is that Karen's already very good at picking out um, <laughs> stories and collaborators, and that is really shining through with these Eisners um, and these books that have won both LaGuardia and Invisible Kingdom. So congratulations to all of you again, um, seriously, and very truly, you were up against some very stiff competition. All of the nominees this year were amazing. Um, and I think Tana gets an extra award just for making that. <laughs> I had to have something to hold. I had to. <laughs> just to. I love it. <laughs> this whole um, thing. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us and for having a little celebration when we can't be together in person, but at least we can be here virtually. And uh, thanks to everybody watching at home. Um, yes. We're happy to be able to give you something you can kind of join in at least a little bit. Um, and final reminder, LaGuardia and Invisible Kingdom, both available in trade paperback now, wherever books and comics are sold. So check out your local comic shops. And as well as the other burger books. So yeah. um, yes, a great yes. There, so. and actually, um, Karen, is, if, is there anything you would like to, to note that might be coming up soon for people to look out for? Uh, we had some news about the seeds. Yeah, the seeds is um, going to be concluded in a trade paperback. Um, it, it is by Anna Sente and David Aha. Um, we put out the first two issues about two years ago, um, but there were some delays um, for some personal issues um, for one of the creators. Everything is fine, which is great, um, but um, the book is, is finished and we decided um, at this point with the pandemic and the uncertainty of, of how many shops are open, um, that is, and, and the time that passed since the first two issues is to put the whole story out complete as, in, as a graphic novel. So we just announced that and that will be out um, right before Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa on December 23rd or 24th, nice. 23rd. Yeah. So um, yeah, so, so definitely look out for that. Um, and we are, you know, doing trades of the next Invisible Kingdom arc as well too and the next everything arc as well too. We're going straight to trade on those books um, as well. And Peter Milligan's The Tomorrow series, we also went straight, we're going straight to trade on that as well too. Um, the pandemic, you know, affected us all um, and, and series that were ongoing and with the world shut down, you know, for, you know, for, uh, and still shut down in so many places. Um, you know, we had to really, you know, look at things carefully and economically figure out the best way to to finish these great stories and to get them out there in, in, in you know, in the best possible way. So, um, so that's what we're doing. Um, but there'll be more as we get closer to dates and on sale dates, more announcements there. But, um, but yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming on the panel. This was great. This is a lot of fun. And um, and everyone who's watching us, and to Kara especially for pulling this all together. Yes, thank, thank you, Kara. Yeah. My pleasure.
Well, thank you all so much. And like Karen said, we are working furiously behind the scenes to get everything rescheduled and continue these series are not canceled. So stay tuned, lots of new books coming out in the upcoming months. And we'll be sure to put all of that online, darkhorse.com and on social media. So stay tuned for lots more. Thank you so much again to every single one of you and congratulations on Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.